Give him a self set up. If you want to, go on and turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we are going to be covering, uh, well, our brother Peter. He brings the first sermon on the gospel of Christ in public, right there. And it's a, it's a powerful moment. And I'm hoping that's what I'm going to convey to you tonight, is that when you study God's word, it is truly living and active. And it is powerful. And the more and more I study, <clears throat> the more I realize how weak an individual I am uh, and how much I am blessed to be in Christ. So I want to set the stage, if you will. I'm going to set the stage a little bit. Well, here before I do that, let me get over to Acts myself. I want to set the stage a little bit about the, the crowd because the crowd matters in this scene. I think it's too easy to either hear the Word of God, to read through the Word of God, and then sometimes you gloss over what's being said or what you read. And this is really a very, to me, a very powerful section that I've slowed down and I've been studying. <clears throat> and uh, so anyways, I wanted to share that with you. I'm hoping that you will... Be encouraged in Christ that you will see the power that is here with the gospel of Christ as it's being shared for the first time in a public setting. So let's set the time period and the crowd. Let's talk about the time and the crowd. So the time, if you will, is about 53 days, if my counting is right based on everything I've read and tried to study, we are 53 days after Jesus was put nailed to a cross. We are sitting here 50 days after he is resurrected from the dead. And he is alive. And I remind you that when the angel, when they were looking, the disciples were looking for Jesus' body, the angel said, why do you look for the living among the dead? To me, that was an incredibly powerful statement. And it's repeated in different ways, not necessarily the exactly the same way, but it's repeated whenever it talks about Almighty God. I'm reminded of the time that Jesus said, uh, you are mistaken because God is the God of the living. And, and that's exactly what we are now in Christ. We are alive. The alternative is death. I mean, that's just as simple as that. So let's set this time period so here we are, and Jesus, after he's resurrected, it says at the beginning of Acts chapter 1 that he spent 40 days with the apostles. And then he, is a, he ascends into heaven, is taken up in the clouds, and then about 10 days, 10 days afterwards, we have the Pentecost. All right. The reason why I want to talk about the time is because if we go back 53 days from today, that puts us, my math is right, on September 8th. Is that a very long period of time? It isn't, right? Um, humans are programmed about time. Time is part of us. It's just what, the way we are. We, it's part of our lives. We, we measure on time. 53 days, even 53 days can seem like a different 53 days than one other 53 days. Uh, my example is this. You are going to spend 53 days in the county jail. Okay, you only have 53 days to live. Significant difference. 53 days in the county jail sounds like a very long time when you're told that you only have 53 days left to live. All of a sudden, that sounds like seconds. Time matters um, to us humans, to God, obviously. A day is a thousand years, and a thousand years are a day. But we are wired with time, and so my point of pointing out this time period is understanding that we're getting to now this crowd. This crowd is literally only 53 days along, and things have been happening. And they know about this 
All right? They know about the happenings of what's been going on. Now, does every one of them? Maybe not. But in a time when they didn't have social media, as we do, they knew about what was happening. Because it was significant. Jesus, this great prophet, this rabbi, was nailed to a cross and executed on a cross. What's up with that? you got to think about what the crowd may be thinking. How many of this crowd saw Jesus perform some of the miracles? How many of this crowd that are here at the, at the Pentecost in Jerusalem are some of that crowd that were fed by Jesus? How many of this crowd are the ones who chanted, crucify, crucify, when they, were, when they were yelling at Pilate? I don't know. But I'm going to guess some of them were there. How many of them walked by Jesus as he hung on the cross? I don't know. But I'm going to guess some of them were there. There were witnesses here, and we're going to find a little bit out about that here in just a moment. So Paul's about to address this crowd. But something that's significant on this day of Pentecost is that there is what seemed to be um, tongues made of flame that came down and rested on each of the apostles, and there's now 12. And they can now go, and they have gone out, and they are in public, and they are speaking. And people from all about Judea are hearing their native language, their dialect, um, that's significant because that draws in the crowd. And they start asking questions, what's going on here? Why is it that I'm hearing my native tongue? Why, how can this be? And, and when humans can't explain things, there often becomes a foolish argument. Such as, these guys have got to be drunk. Because that makes all the logical sense in the world. They're drunk. That's why I can hear them speaking my language. Makes no sense to me, but that's sort of what they came to. And I believe that in the opening of Paul's stance, his speech that he's about to give this sermon, that's exactly what he basically extinguishes really quick. So before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about these, this crowd This crowd's probably had a lot of conversations going on, too. And I think that's important to think about. Um, conversations maybe just between two good friends. Man, have you been keeping up with what's going on? I'm telling you, this is weird stuff going on. Why did they crucify this Jesus? I mean, I saw him, I saw him perform these miracles. He had to be a great prophet. And his friend might be on the other side of it going, well, you know, Caiaphas is the high priest. You know, so he's a god, right? He's a godly man, so, I mean, he's got to be right. You know, there's got to be his, his discussions. I think they've been going on. And it could be between two people, it could be three, it could be groups of dozens, I don't know. But I think this has been the talk of the town, is my point. So when this crowd is gathered, I believe God has already planted the seed, and that was his plan. People are wanting to know what is going on, what just happened. So if you will, the, uh, how's it go, the National Enquirer, I don't know if they still use that, but inquiring minds want to know because we're curious. So let's take a look at this crowd, what Peter is about to stand up and say to them. So again, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. I pause here before we get into this part. This is a... I, I really believe that Peter is literally, is almost indignant at this point because he's 
about to sit there and say, in your ignorance, you come up with a foolish argument for what you're seeing and hearing. Because what you are seeing and hearing is God fulfilling prophecy right here in your sight and before your eyes. So let's continue on. And it shall be in the last days, God says, emphasis, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's from the prophet Joel. All right, so... That's what God prophesied through Joel about 800. I roughly was coming up with this. You got to sort of give it a. So let's see, it's about 835 BC was when Joel was around. So it's, it's about 800, roughly 60 something years, 865 years. You know, I'm going to give it a ballpark there. Earlier than this day. All right? Again. Time, think about that. God is already planting the seed hundreds, centuries before all this. Hundreds of years and centuries before all this. So, something, a couple of key points to think about. Well, I was thinking about the prophesying part, because it's a lot about prophesy, right? Well, Jesus quoted a lot of the prophets. And there's also some interesting things that happen. When Jesus, in uh, Luke chapter 2, and Jesus is a, a baby boy, and he's taken to the temple, there was Simeon, an old man, and filled with the Holy Spirit. And he had had visions, dreams. And then there was Anna, who was a prophetess. And Anna was an old woman, and she was well respected at the temple. And I was thinking that, is it that Joel was prophesying of these, that this was part of it? I think so, because they both came and they greeted the baby Jesus. And they gave him a greeting that was a little bit unique compared with other babies. So this is something that I just... Through my studies, I thought it was interesting. But we continue on. Now, if you know anything about uh, wonders in the sky above, I, my, my studies make me think that this is about the appearing, well, it could be the star that we know that appeared, the Jesus' birth. I think that is part of it. I also wonder if it was when the angels appeared to the shepherds because they appeared in the sky. Uh, you wonder about things like signs on the earth. Well, we'll get to that in just a moment. I think that comes through Jesus. It talks about blood. I think that comes through Jesus. Um, you know, there's this interesting thing about the sun will be turned into darkness. We know that there's an eclipse when Jesus dies. The moon into blood, that's actually, a, that happened too. It didn't have the blood become, the moon becomes bloody, right? But it turned to red. It happens. It's actually, my understanding, is a reflection off of Mars. The sun and the Mars line up, and it becomes a reflection onto the moon from Mars, and that's why it shone red. Now, it's happened in our lifetime. I can't remember, I didn't check on when the last time, but it happened recently. Well, recent in the last decade or something. But anyway, but it's, it's a happening. That's also as interesting as that's recorded in a report that was sent to Caesar at this time from the land of Judea. It's a separate report. It's, uh, I wish I could remember the name of the book, and I was, trying, I was trying to find it 
today, but I couldn't find it. But there's a book, and it's a collection of reports that were found that were sent to the Caesars during a very long period of time. And these reports would come from people like governors, like Pilate. And they would send in these reports, and there was a report that was sent in about the unusual happening in which the sun turned red like blood. But anyways, so God does these things. He says, I'm going to do things. He, they're going to happen. If there's anything we can trust about God, it's going to happen. So let's continue on. Because now that we've got Joel laid out, and Peter's put this forth, and he's saying, look, what you're hearing is prophecy that has been fulfilled, prophecy that is being fulfilled, and what is about to be fulfilled. So Acts 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. So now he's got, he just pulled this whole crowd in, and he's making them witnesses too. You know it, it's true. And that, was, that comes back to my point about this crowd. How, much, how many of this crowd had seen the healings that had happened? How many in this crowd were those who may have been healed? How many in this crowd had witnessed what Jesus did? And I really believe that there's quite a few there. There has to be at least one. But everything that Jesus did, they're there. And Peter knows it because he's been inspired by God with that knowledge. This man, Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. All right. So if you're having a speech and you're trying to draw people to you, this probably was the losing line. All right? There might be some people going, oh, whatever. I don't want to hear it anymore. I'm tired of it. But the discussions have been going on. So people still want to know, so I'm in, I'm in, the people are listening. But I think there's a few out there who might. But I think Peter transitions really good because he goes, But God, Yahweh, raised him up again. You think that might have caught a few ears? You think that might have pricked a few of the uh, brain cells? Yeah, you put him to death, but God raised him up again. All right, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him, Jesus, to be held in its power. What, what is this man saying? Is he crazy? This Peter is up here talking. This man who is a fisherman, and he's up here talking about this Jesus is resurrected? Well, no, let's talk about some of that. Um, do you think anyone in this crowd may have witnessed Jesus walking around? We know that the 11 were up there, right? You remember the two men that Jesus were, uh, that meets on the road? They don't, they're, they're withheld from knowing who he is, and he walks with them. And he ends up having a meal with them. And then their eyes are open and they go, it's Jesus. Um, yeah, I, I think some people probably witness, they're in the crowd, they're going, uh, hey, this is true. My brother-in-law saw him. Oh, whatever, be quiet. You know, this, this is the crowd. I want you to think about what's going on here. This crowd, I think, is mesmerized and focused because they literally are now getting focus brought in for all of those questions they have. Peter is focusing in on Jesus, and he's about to give them an answer to all the questions that have been going on for 53 days. So, 
For David says of him, again, Jesus. Now, what is David to this crowd? Well, David's like hero, right? I mean, if you had, a, if you had collector cards back in the day, whoo, you had a David collector card, like a rookie card, oh yeah, that would have been boss, right? I mean, this is David, King David. And, and Peter draws them in even further now and says, for David says of Jesus, well, okay. I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exulted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And Peter goes deeper in to explain what he's just quoted David saying. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Right here in Jerusalem, right here with us, is the tomb of David. We'll talk about why that's important in just a moment. And so, because he was a prophet, David, and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. God raised him from the dead. David prophesied about the resurrection of Christ. The transition here is that he has now connected some dots for them. What I am talking about here is Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you all know performed all kinds of miracles. And now he just connected a dot and he's saying, and, and now we have the resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah. I'm telling you, these people now are entrenched in this conversation. <clears throat> so what's important is, and he's going to go in a little more detail about going back to why David's tomb is right here, because David isn't the one who's prophesying about himself. David isn't talking about himself when he says, you won't allow your Holy One to see decay. Because David's body saw decay. It lays in the tomb right there in Jerusalem. It's right there with them. All right, so I'm going to go back here, 31. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Now, this all witnesses, I believe, is the 12. It's Peter and the 11. All right, the reason why I say that is because back in chapter 1, when they're trying to replace Judas Iscariot because they needed a 12th man, right? All right? One of the criteria, there's a lot of criteria. As a matter of fact, let's just go back and look at that real quick because we need to look at this. So there's Barsabbas, and uh, I always want to mess up and call this guy something else. It's Matthias. All right, so they're looking for guys, and they say, Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John, until the day that he, Jesus, was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. All right, so I believe that when he says all of us, he's talking about Peter and the 11 guys that are up here with me. All right? So he just is talking about the resurrection. He's saying, you are hearing today Prophecy fulfilled. David prophesied this. God inspired him to. God has fulfilled this prophecy today. It is here. So this crowd is in. I think they're, they're really listening. <clears throat> 
Starting at verse 33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. You see and hear us speaking today, your tongue, your language. You hear us talking about prophecy fulfilled. You are hearing the Holy Spirit speak. For today God has fulfilled this. For it was not David, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Do you hear the power of the gospel of Christ? He brings in the Old Testament, the prophecies that God put in place centuries upon centuries before this time period. God had already seeded this audience the thoughts of what's been going on. They have been raised to know about this Messiah, the Christ to come. They have been raised in the prophecies and the prophets. They knew. They just didn't, they weren't sure. There were some that were like, man, it's got to be, but something just isn't right. And there were some that were absolutely fighting against it. When he got to this point and he says, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, he just pinned the tail on the donkey. He hit a bullseye. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Now we know on that day 3,000 were added to the Lord's church. That was not a small crowd. I think it started out maybe with 10, 20, then 30, because they're hearing all those different languages, and they're like, what is going on? Next thing you know, you got a couple hundred, and it kept building. God planted the seed and they brought them. They wanted to know. They had to know. Something just wasn't right about what we've witnessed and heard and continue to talk about for the last 53 days. If there was a time to go to Jerusalem for the Pentecost, this was the time. Because something has got to, an answer's got to be coming. Something's got to be about to happen. And it did. God delivered it. And 12 brothers, the apostles, and he delivered the gospel of Christ for the first time to the crowd, to the public. And that is power. Now here's, the, here's what I, the takeaway I want you to take away from this is this. That power still exists. But we forget. That power still exists to this day. Almost 2,000 years after that day, that Pentecost, that power exists. Right, Tyrone? It exists in Ethiopia, right? And the brethren that are in South Sudan. It exists all throughout this earth, people. When we get downtrodden and we think that we are outnumbered, those who are with us are greater than those who are against us. I am guilty of not standing up for Christ enough and sharing the gospel with Christ, but I'm changing my ways and I'm trying to reach out to people and do studies with them. I'm trying to find a way that I can speak to people without being angry, without being bitter about it, but I'm going to tell you what, 
God cuts it really just down to two ways, people. Light, dark, life, death. Pick it. Either you're with Jesus or you don't have Jesus. And we have got to get that message out because that's our job. And why wouldn't we want to? Look at the benefits we have. Are we not happy in Christ? Do we not have joy and hope beyond this world? Well, I hope that we do. So as you go out, here's my encouragement for Christ. The Word of God is living and active and powerful to this very day. Read, listen, and study His Word and consistently, consistently and passionately and seek His will in all things at all times. God still speaks to us and through us, but only if we seek His will. So, the invitation stands in a moment. And uh, I want you to really consider, if you're not in Christ, I don't know how else to compel you except to say, you need to be in Christ. Because it's eternal life. It's beautiful, it's powerful, it's humbling. And for those who are in Christ and who need encouragement, who stumbled, man, brothers and sisters, let us pray for you. And if anybody, if you come up here and, 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 and you confess a sin or you come up here and say, I need prayers because I feel weak or whatever, and if anybody in here wants to go and gossip about you because you did that, direct me in their path because I will go speak to them. Until we start learning to stop sticking putting dents in the back of our own armor. Because we do on occasion. We're people. We still slip every once in a while. But when a brother and a sister is hurting with sin, there isn't judgment. There isn't gossip. There's, we're right there with you. And we love you. So keep that in mind. Thank you very much for taking, letting me speak tonight. Let's stand.